Hey, TC family. It is at the end of our beliefs series. How many of you have loved hearing about the different postures and the different perspectives of TC when it comes to what we believe about the kingdom of God, what we believe about Jesus and what we believe about his church? I love being able to share with you and our objective at TC is always to unify. So everything that we've been sharing through this series, the heart has been to bring unity and clarity to the body of Christ. This week, which is our last week, we are talking about, of course, we saved the best for last, Jesus. We're talking about who Jesus is, what the cross really meant, and what does it mean to have salvation. You know, the fact of the matter is, is I heard a story the other day, and, well, not a story, I'm sorry, a quote. Well, to be honest, it was an Instagram cap, a caption. But what it said was, Jesus is already famous. We don't need to make him famous. And I thought about that for a second. I thought, wow, that's a really challenging perspective, but the truth is, is that it, it's true that Jesus is already famous. doesn't matter what religion you come from, what cultural background you come from. Almost everybody has heard about Jesus, but the truth is, is oftentimes maybe you've heard the name of Jesus. You've uh, connected Jesus to the Christian faith or a world of faith, but maybe you don't really understand who Jesus is. So I would say that maybe it isn't our job to make Jesus famous or even make him known, but to help you understand really who this person Jesus is. See, I think most of the issue comes when we don't represent who Jesus is well. Maybe as Christian leaders or teachers, we are motivated by fear to really preach the true character of Christ. Maybe we think that somehow uh, living out a life of faith looks like self-righteousness, but instead it is really supposed to be Christ's righteousness, pointing back and glorifying him. See, oftentimes we don't portray who Jesus is well, so I want to take some time and sit down or stand with you all today and make sure we have clear understanding of who our Jesus is. You know, there's a book of Hebrews in the New Testament and the church, uh, the Hebrew church in the New Testament, they had a really hard time understanding exactly who Jesus is because they were looking at Jesus and they were trying to kind of mix who Jesus was with what they understood about the law and the old covenant. And they were having a hard time gaining clarity. And I love how clear and simple the writer of Hebrews makes it when he talks about who Jesus is. This is what he says in Hebrews 1, verse 1 through 3. Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our forefathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. I want to stop right there and point out the fact that the writer of Hebrews is acknowledging that Over time, throughout history, God has spoken to his people in many different ways. And that's something we can all really understand. It doesn't matter what faith you come from. Your faith probably has a understanding or a belief in different prophets and voices from God throughout time and throughout history. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, listen, this is true for all of us. Throughout time, God has spoken through different men. But I want to read to you from verse 2. But in these last days... He has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed to be the heir of all things, whom he also created the world. Now, there is serious weight in what the writer just communicated. He said, there have been many different vessels, vehicles of the message of God for us. But now he speaks to us through his own son. See, There was a time in a more patriarchal society that messengers would be sent by kings and these messengers were there to relay a message of a king. However, if there was a message that was in dire need of complete accuracy, no misconception or no getting mixed up in translation, someone really important would come. Oftentimes it would be the son or the heir of the king to deliver the message personally to confirm that there was absolute clarity and absolute reception of the message. And who is our God? Our God is a king who sent his own son to confirm that we would understand his message for us with absolute clarity. Verse three, it says, he is the radiance, talking about Jesus, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand 
of the majesty on high. See, if I could just say in short who our Jesus is, he is the perfect representation of the Father God. If you've ever thought the Father God is this cruel tyrant, this evil beast of a God there to torture men, to condemn men, you're missing it. See, Jesus, the humble servant, Jesus, the King of kings, Jesus, the sacrificial king who came to lay down his life for you and I, he, my friends, is the exact representation of who God really is. And the fact of the matter is, is we needed this reinforcement. But now that you know, you can actually look back at the scriptures. When there has been misconception about who Jesus is, you can look back at the scriptures and understand it finally makes sense. It's kind of like, uh, I don't know, I remember there was this one time when we were first married and we didn't have a lot of money and my friend had a kind of car brokering business and I got a old Cadillac. And man, I love that old Cadillac. It was so comfortable and it drove so sweet, but it only cost me about 500 bucks. And it's funny because I got this Cadillac and I said, man, I've never really seen this model before. This car is awesome. But quickly after I got the car and started driving, I started noticing that I saw that same model of Cadillac everywhere, all throughout the city that I was living in. See, sometimes until we're exposed to something, we don't see what we've been exposed to. But once we're exposed, then we just see it everywhere. It's like the blinders have come off and now we can see clearly because the fact of the matter is, is when it says in Hebrews that Jesus is the perfect representation of God, this humble, serving, sacrificial king who put on flesh and came to meet us where we are in our circumstances is the heart of God. And that's always how God has displayed himself to us. Let's just go back to the very beginning. Let's start at the beginning of the narrative in the fall of man. When Adam and Eve ate that apple, that famous story, the serpent in the garden, let's look at God's response to Adam and Eve the moment they failed and fell out of line. It says in verse 8 of Genesis chapter 3, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. See that? It says they heard the sound of him walking because he came down as a man with feet walking through the garden. See, what's beautiful about our God is he always is willing to meet us where we are in a way we can receive him. This is the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord's response to them hiding, but the Lord God called to the man and said, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you walking in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Let me ask you a question. Who was hiding from who? Who had turned away from who? This is important. Sometimes people of faith get the wrong message in their head and their heart and they teach about a God and they teach about a Savior that turns his back on sin and turns his back on us. But nowhere do we see in the narrative of the story of the person of Jesus that he would ever turn his back or hide from us, but it's always us hiding and turning our back from him out of fear, shame, or failure. See, it's them hiding from him and he seeks them out. This is the character of our God. We see again later in the book of Genesis when there becomes an encounter with Jesus and this man Israel, formerly known as Jacob, who was the father of these tribes of Israel, who we see a recollection, really the main characters of all of the old covenant. I want to read to you from Genesis 35 when God comes down again incarnate as man to meet Jacob, where he was because Jacob was in need. See, Jacob was living in a life of his own performance, believing in himself, and it had, it had really dictated a lot of brokenness. But look how God meets him. God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Padam Aram, and he blessed him, and God said to him, your name is not Jacob any longer, but your name is Israel. See, he changed his name from Jacob to Israel because in the name of that man also shaped the identity and the name Israel means God is my help. See what he was saying to Jacob in his trial and in this life of drama and upset. He met him and he said, Jacob, it's time for you to start looking to me as your help, not looking just to help yourself. See, our God has always been there to meet us in our pain. 
Jesus represents a God. He took the form of man to show us a God that doesn't stand back with his arms crossed like an angry father waiting for us to get our lives together, but like a father who gets down on one knee and meets his children where they are to show us his compassion and his love. And finally, I want to read to you a scripture from John. See, this is the revelation of the man, Jesus Christ, incarnate when he came, lived his life for 33 years to give a full display of who God is, only to give his life to show the sacrificial nature of God. In John 1, verse 1, this is what it says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word referred to Jesus. And we're going to explain that. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. That's an interesting way of describing who Jesus is. It says that he was the Word. See, the Word of God is the manifestation of God's heart and head to us. He feels it. He thinks it. So therefore, he speaks it. It's the manifestation of God's heart and head towards us. It's Jesus Christ who is the manifestation of God's heart and head to us. It says that he is, was with God and he is God. He is the very deity while also being the very manifestation. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him, nothing was made. He has always been there. It says also in the scripture that he has loved us before the foundation of the world. Before you sat on this couch and watched this message, he saw you sitting here and he said, I can't wait for my son and my daughter to hear about me and how much I love them. That's always been the mission of God displayed through the person of Jesus Christ. And this is what I'm going to finish with. And we're going to end here. It says in Hebrews 10, when it's talking about Jesus, and the writer of Hebrews is helping the church there understand the role of Jesus to them as their priest. See, they understood the language of priest rather well, but he's trying to help them understand that a priest can only do so much, but Jesus, as your new high priest, he can do everything. It says that and every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifice, which can never take away sins, but when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God. And I'm going to stop here and I'm going to break all of this down because this is really important that you understand. Number one, the priestly system, they thought that the sacrifices offered were going to bring full redemption to man. But we know that throughout all of history, Throughout all of religion, it doesn't matter what you believe, Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, it doesn't matter what you, all, what you believe. Sacrifice is a part of your faith. You have to give and give and give at the hope of achieving more and more right standing with your God. But Jesus came to change the way we think. He came to change our minds. He said, Listen to me, your God no longer requires you to give sacrifices like you have in the past. I'm going to give my life as a sacrifice to prove to you and to show you that God's heart is for you. See, the truth of faith is that Jesus didn't come and sacrifice everything on the altar to change God's mind about us. He came to change our mind about God. Where we thought we needed to earn God's love with sacrifices. Where we thought we needed to pay for our own sins through offering. Jesus is saying, that's not the God that you serve. You don't fix your own sins, fix your own issues, or perform well enough to earn God's love. God already loves you. And he's willing to give up everything to show you how much he loves you. That's why he sent me to pour out my life. That's the message of Jesus Christ. And then it says that he offered for all time a single sacrifice to sin. 
That means Jesus saw it all. He didn't just wipe clean and take care of every issue that you had before coming to God, coming to Christ. But he saw every sin you would ever commit, every issue, every failure. You may be thinking, well, he didn't see this. He doesn't know about this. Man, I haven't told anybody this. Jesus saw it all. And he says, I will cover all of it with one offering, one sacrifice to prove to you finally and forever that you are forgiven and restored. That God's heart is not against you. That God's face is not angry towards you. But he desires relationship with you. And who wouldn't want a relationship with a God that's willing to give himself to make a way? This is who we have in our Savior, Jesus Christ. He's our Redeemer. He's our Restorer. He's our Healer. And he's a perfect representation of our Father God who gave it all for all time. He came and gave his life at the cross for you and me just at the hope that our hearts and minds would be changed in the way we see who God is. And you know, I often think Jesus could have died anyway. He could have died by jumping off a cliff and sacrificing himself. He could have died by sword. He could have died in battle. There are so many different ways he could have given up his life, but he died on the cross. And this is what's so beautiful about the cross, I'll tell you right now, is the cross is probably one of the most evil, vicious, hatred-filled instruments mankind has ever created. If you read about the history and the heart behind crucifixion on a cross, it is evil. But Jesus chose this evil, evil instrument made by the hands of the men that he was trying to restore relationship with. He chose this instrument to die on. He chose this instrument to give his life. Why? This is why. He wanted to show us that the worst, most evil work of our hands, even it, could be redeemed by the depth and the width and the power of our Father's love. There's nothing too far from God's hand to redeem. There's nothing so evil that Jesus can't climb into the situation with you and find redemption, reconciliation, and healing. This is who our Jesus is. And when we put our faith in him, when we say, I trust in you, when we establish relationship with him, what we're saying is I believe what you've done, what you say, and who you are. And I'm going to begin to trust and have a relationship with you. And that's salvation. Salvation is that there's a change in our hearts, a change in our minds, that we begin to trust and believe in the person of Jesus Christ. So friends and family, That's my heart. That's God's heart for us. That's the heart of the collective. Is that in everything, above all else, in every situation, we would continue to believe in Jesus. Let's pray. So Father God, I just thank you so much for your incredible, 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 incredible life. Lord, that you are not just words on paper, You are not statues in a church or a temple, but you are a real person who revealed himself in a real way to show us your real heart for us. God, I pray for anybody watching right now that is on the fence, whether they want to believe or put their faith in Jesus, I pray that these words in this message would warm their hearts to your love, that they would decide today to begin to journey with you. And if there's anybody listening to this right now, and you feel like you've fallen away, you've failed, and even now maybe you feel like hiding from God, I would say, turn and hear his voice calling out to you just like he called to Adam and Eve. Where are you, my son, my daughter? Where are you? I'm here to redeem. So Father, I thank you that we are people forever turning to you in everything we do. We thank you for your life, your death, and your resurrection. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 
All right, TC family, I hope you've enjoyed the series all about the beliefs of the collective. We'll see you next time.